to be connected now. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Carlos, for those of you that uh, don't know me. I'm the current president of Adelante and I will be moderating this panel. Um, I'm a senior, I use any pronouns, um, any respectful pronouns, so he, she, they. Um, and yeah, I'll let the panelists introduce um, themselves um, with the name, pronouns, their graduating class and uh, kind of the field that they work in, um, in terms of law. All right, Luz, we can start with you. Thank you, Carlos, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Luz Lopez. My pronouns are ella, she, her. I graduated from Kenyan. My goodness, I don't know if we can go back that far. Um, but no, I, I graduated in 1992. Uh, I started in the class of uh, 92. I started in 88, of course. Um, and I was just mentioning to Carlos and Kim uh, that this is truly a full circle moment for me. Um, the last time I was at Kenyon was actually less than four or five months ago for my 30th um, class anniversary reunion. And I brought my teenage children who really enjoy visiting Kenyon. They've been there a couple of times now. And I'm really um, honored and glad to be engaged in this conversation. I think I can tell you a little bit more about what I do um, now, or should I just wait and incorporate into my responses? Um, should I just, I'm a lawyer. Yeah, go for it. Okay, thank you. I've been practicing for almost 30 years. I see Professor Sheffield on the call, so I'm nervous. <laughs> um, he was one of the people uh, who taught me about the law first. So I thank you for that, Professor Sheffield. And yeah, I was a psychology major while I was at Kenyon. And um, I really learned to explore and love the law through Professor Sheffield and others who um, I'm really glad are still there sharing their knowledge and their excitement um, for this field with others. I have always practiced civil rights law. I served as a public defender in the capital crime units of the um, unit, excuse me, of the Ohio Public Defender Office for the first five years out of law school. I then spent almost 20 years with the US Department of Justice Civil Rights Division, engaging in voting, language access, um, employment discrimination uh, enforcement. And during the Trump years, I left to join the Southern Poverty Law Center, which is one of the largest civil rights organizations fighting anti-discrimination, including anti-immigrant uh, laws and sentiment in the Deep South. Uh, this is where I currently work and serve uh, our community. So thank you for your time again. I will pass it on to um, Gerard. I'm Gerard Solis, good afternoon. Thank you for having me on this panel. I had. Uh, uh, Professor Sheffield as well, uh, a while back. I graduated from Kenyon in 1995. Uh, I was a philosophy major. Uh, I'm currently the Senior Vice President for Legal Affairs and General Counsel at the University of South Florida in Tampa, Florida. And I've been practicing law since 2000, uh, originally in um, employment, uh, labor and employment matters. And since transitioning over to the university, I started here in 2003 as an Assistant General Counsel, done a little bit of everything. Uh, a lot of what I do right now is around constitutional issues, uh, First Amendment in particular. Uh, that's an active topic, academic freedom and free expression in Florida right now. Um, but I'm very happy to be part of this conversation. Yeah, and then uh, Javier. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm Javier Flores. I am uh, the office managing partner in Boston for Dinsmore and Scholl. Uh, uh, he, him, his are my, are my pronouns, and I am a 2003 uh, Kenyan grad with a political science major. Um, so I, my, my practice is all uh, primarily commercial-based litigation. Uh, I, I do a lot of business-to-business -business disputes, breach of contract, um, and then I do also some, uh, some, some defense of uh, you know, catastrophic injury cases, uh, often representing product manufacturers or in, in some instances, uh, colleges and universities, when there's a, a high profile death on campus or a, a significant injury. Um, and that's been my primary area of practice since 
about 2007, I, I worked about a year and a half as a public defender right out of law school when I first moved to Boston and, uh, and loved that, um, but uh, decided that uh, I was going to sell out and to do something that would, would pay a little better. Um, so, uh, Carlos, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, oh, I should um, point out, thank you. I, I, had, I had Professor Sheffield as well. Uh, I had media in the law at 7.40 a.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So uh, for whatever reason, that time just sticks with me. <laughs> um, yeah, well, thank you all for introducing yourselves. Um, you know, I clearly see that you all had very different kind of um, majors and kind of tracks that you focused on while you were at Kenyon. So I wanted to ask what influenced your choice to follow a career path in law? Um, like what influenced that decision, um, that specific field? Um, were there any influences at Kenyan um, and your Latinidad? How does that kind of play into um, your current per professional life? And then anybody who, um, who could speak on it, um, yeah, feel free to jump in. I'm, I'm happy to go first. Um, I just, uh, you know, I had a, my maternal grandfather was a lawyer. So, you know, I had, uh, you know, uh, someone, you know, who was in my everyday life from a young age who was a lawyer and, and he was, a, you know, someone that I, uh, I looked up to. And so I think that that had a significant impact on my thinking from an early age. But, you know, I, I made a, just because the way I make decisions, I, I made a, a decision very young that I was going to be a lawyer and, and never really wavered from it. Um, you know, I guess my real first exposure to the law was, was through Professor Sheffield's class. And, and I loved it. And um, it, it, it only reinforced what I already had had told myself I was going to do. So, you know, uh, my senior year of Kenya, uh, Kenyan, I, you know, I knew I was going to apply to law school and, and, and geared everything towards that and, and, you know, transitions right from Kenyan into law school. Yeah, I mean, um, Lewis, I'm kind of interested in, in um, to hear kind of your perspective, um, because you, you mentioned that you worked in um, immigrant justice and um, I'm curious how um, your experience at Kenya kind of influenced that, particularly because before we were talking about um, kind of your experience uh, being there when Adelante was first being founded um, and kind of all that transition um, at the school. Thank you for the question. Yeah, I never wanted to be a lawyer. I had always dreamt of uh, going into medicine. We have some doctors in our family. I'm a, I'm a proud immigrant. I wasn't born in the U.S., I came to the U.S. when I was 10 years old. My family was fleeing uh, the U.S. You know, sponsored civil war in El Salvador. Um, my parents were both educators and very active um, leftists. So we came to the U.S. and I had always wanted to dedicate my life to medicine, helping others. Um, I admired, you know, doctors in our family. What happened at Kenyon really changed my life. You know, there were some really good experiences, and then there were really some very challenging experiences for me um, that eventually led me to choose um, the law. Perhaps the two most influential were um, first, my I you know spent my junior year abroad, like most people at Kenyon, and I split it between um, studying in Greece and Athens and studying in Madrid, Spain. When I arrived in Madrid in um, early 1991, the first Gulf War had just started. And um, there was a lot of unrest, a lot of anti-US sentiment. And before I arrived there, I actually never identified as a person from the US. I was just living here uh, and hoping to at some point go back to my country of El Salvador. But um, I, it was in Madrid where I first um, saw firsthand racial discrimination, unabated racism. And I spent most of my time with folks from my program. My closest friends, one uh, was from New York, like I was, where I grew up. Uh, he's Jamaican. Uh, and then um, we hung out with a young woman who was of Middle Eastern descent. And every time we would walk down the street, invariably, there would be racial slurs you know, hurled at us just really awful, awful uh, environment. And then I thought to myself, 
wow, I am leaving the program after a few months, but I thought about going back to the US and how a lot of, you know, my dear and close black brothers and sisters didn't really have the option to leave the US once they went through a really traumatic, you know, racial experience. Um, and I thought that is, you know, that that really changed the way I saw things, um, how pernicious and prevalent racism was in Spain wasn't really any different than um, what was happening in the US. So when I came back, I thought, what can I do um, to change the you know, system? And then the second thing, I actually uh, was mentored by Dr. Frank Hale um, and my close friend, Evelyn Ortiz, who graduated with me in 92. She was the co-founder of Adelante. Um, she said to me, why aren't you interested in law? You know, you, you talk a lot about politics. Why aren't you, you know, getting involved in it? And I said, I just have never thought about it. And we spoke to Dr. Hale a few times. Um, I didn't know Dr. Hale was this preeminent civil rights warrior. He, in fact, he has a building named after him at Ohio State. Um, and he ended up inspiring Evelyn and me to apply. We both ended up going to Ohio State together, um, and uh, it was thanks to you know his inspiration and his support. Um, and Kenyon had brought him on board because there was a need for mentorship. Uh, there were very few of us at that time, very few visible um, Latina people, um, indigenous folks, people who identified as indigenous, etc. So he was truly. Um, just sent from above. And, uh, you know, I would say those two things, um, just the discovery of how cruel and unjust um, the world could be for persons merely because of what they look like, things that, you know, immutable characteristics, as they say in the law. Um, and Dr. Hale's, you know, story of his civil rights leadership, those things were the ones that inspired me. And uh, I'm really grateful uh, to him. May he rest in peace. He was great. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for sharing. Uh, and Gerard, I want to give you a moment to speak as well. Um, but I, I'm curious, you know, like um, uh, all three of you mentioned uh, Professor Sheffield, um, his impact on kind of your career development and your time at Kenyon. Um, so I was wondering if there were more professors that kind of um, geared you toward law and then also who helped you um, and supported you while you were at Kenyon and kind of helping you in your steps after you graduated. Uh, I, I, I'm sure that, uh, first of all, I wanna thank Luz for, Luz for her, um, what she just shared with us. I, I, don't, I don't have a story like that, that would be, uh, but I'm inspired by hers. Um, but I was certainly inspired by many professors at Kenyon particularly in my home major of philosophy and um, just developing um, it, a, a, a real respect for how hard it is to, to write clearly, to express yourself clearly <clears throat> and the connection between you know, clear writing and clear thinking, the, the two don't happen separately. <laughs> and um, that has helped me in every phase of my career uh, going forward, and 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 my philosophy professors encouraged me to pursue either potential PhD work in in philosophy. Um, but after they saw me present in a class once, I don't know if they maybe I got the wrong message. They're like, "You should be a lawyer. <laughs> that would be a, be a better fit for you." Um, uh, but it's you know one one of the wonderful things about law, um, in, you know, in addition to being able to work. On matters of justice, of course, if, if that's your practice and your passion and that's where you're called, but you get to work with language every day and, and really crafting um, uh, you know, messages that, that will have an impact on, on, on others. You don't have a lot of time to do it. I'm sure Javier, who's in a private firm, is quite aware of the, 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 the amount of time he has to bill and, and so on uh, to make those things happen, but that's really a privilege to get to do that. Um, and uh, when I was applying for law school at Kenyon, uh, uh, Dean of Students was a guy named Craig Bradley, 
who gave me uh, a great suggestion on my law school sort of personal statement. He goes, you grew up in a bilingual home. You should talk about how that's affected your perspective, what it was like to, you know, to walk out of your house. The language you grew up in is a language no one else speaks. And then also um, what perspective that gives you now, just in terms of uh, how you see the world. And, and it was that insight, I think, that really um, I've carried with me since then. But uh, so I, I credit uh, Dean Bradley with that, and certainly my philosophy professors, Ron McLaren, Rich, Joel Richheimer, in terms of that, that love of language. Yeah, thank you, Gerard. Um, and I'm curious, you know, what do you feel that your Kenyan education adequately prepared all of you? I mean, it's, it's very different um, than, I, I guess, going to law school. Um, it's a liberal arts school, it's very small, but I feel like the quality of the education and the core focuses um, kind of cater to that um, linguistic aspect and kind of critical thinking that is required in, in many fields. Um, so yeah, how do, how do you feel like that translated into your professional lives? Gerard is right. Um, lawyers, uh, pretty much anyone, I would say, um, we communicate for a living. So I tell my kids, you know, I write and speak for a living. That's what I do. And um, I think that Kenyan, Kenyan's emphasis on building up our writing skills, our analytical skills, regardless of your major. I mean, I was a psychology major. If I could have had a minor, it would have been classics. I loved uh, taking you know, ancient mythology, Greek, um, ancient Roman culture. Just, I loved classics. and. I, other than obviously when I started to become more interested in the law, the wonderful Professor Sheffield, uh, who taught me women in the law, that was an awesome gender uh, women in the law, I believe was the name of the course. Most of my courses had nothing to do with, you know, traditionally, I did not, I think I took one poli sci course my senior year, but it was the fact that whether you were taking a psychology course or a classics course or you know a poli sci course you were going to be taught how to express yourself well in writing and obviously with our smaller classes you know um the um i'm trying to remember what we would call the you know the evening classes uh where there were only like six or seven people during my time we could really engage have wonderful discussions and um that all helped build up the skills that I needed to go into the law. So it doesn't really matter what your major is. You could be a you know pre-med, a bio um, major. It's really the, the skill of writing and communicating well. And that for that, I will thank Kenyon um, for the rest of my life. It's been really useful. I, I agree. I, I think Kenyon did an excellent job in preparing me. You know, I, I came from a, a, a small public school, and so uh, there was there was a bit of a, a ramp up for me in terms of the the sophistication of education that was being provided, and and uh, you know, I it definitely took some time for me to to catch up in terms of my writing ability. But I, I think what's really important that you know, as a political science major, is we essentially spent four years with uh, you know, reading and interpreting text and, and having disagreement about what, the, what maybe the intent and the meaning was of plain language. And so much of that is, is what we do today as lawyers, is, is looking at something and trying to explain why what we, what we interpret that meaning to be is, is favorable, in my case, for, for my client. I think also, you know, in addition to the, the formal education, I think a huge part of the benefit for me was the the, the nature of the, the social interaction at Kenyon, you know, with varying degrees of, uh, of actual knowledge of what I was talking about. I spent four years essentially arguing with people about uh, every aspect of, of life and, you know, in, in much more sophisticated discussion than I, I had previously been in. And that ability to think critically and, 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 be, and you know, be able to be, be quick on your feet in engaging with someone about, you know, important issues is is as much uh, you know as much of an importance in terms of 
a future preparation as is the you know the, the more traditional educational aspect yeah i i would underscore that that and and this is maybe where kenyan doesn't prepare you uh fully um you take it for granted at kenyan that you will engage in civil discourse in the sense that you will critically uh engage with topics and and um debate matters discuss matters when you leave Kenyan, not everybody plays by those rules. I mean, Kenyan's not covered by the First Amendment. I mean, as a matter of values and whatnot, you uh, in terms of academic freedom and free exchange of ideas, certainly the institution believes in those things. But once you get out into the so-called marketplace of ideas, the not everybody's into being um, thoughtful and careful about what they say. It's often just the opposite. And, uh, and I feel like Kenyon prepared me for that as, as well, but it initially it was a little bit of a jolt um, to, to, you know, to hear opinions unencumbered by facts uh, or decency for that matter. Because um, you, you really have a very special environment at Kenyon where, where that can exist. It certainly doesn't exist all the time. There's always exceptions. Um, but, uh, but that was a little bit of a, an, an adjustment. I, I I took some time off in between law school and um, and Kenyon. I, I taught English abroad, um, but even going to law school was a little bit uh, jarring. Very little different environment. So in some ways, Kenyon, um, uh, you, you you are very fortunate to be in the environment that you are in with the faculty you have, with the students around you. Um, and even though when you first take your step out, it might be a little jarring, you'll, you'll rapidly learn that, that, that you've got it right. You know, <laughs> the folks that are yelling don't. Um, but that, that's, that's just my reaction to, to that. Yeah, uh, I mean, thank you all for sharing. Um, and I think that kind of leads me into um, kind of the next kind of point that I wanted to talk about. Um, Gerard, earlier you had mentioned about um, kind of growing up in a bilingual household and how um, kind of your mentors told you to use that you know, in order to kind of think critically about how you were gonna go into a field of law and how that impacted your life. So I was wondering, you know, um, besides the kind of environment that Kenyan builds, you know, how did your personal identities, um, your Latina identity kind of play out in the, circum in the chain of events that kind of led you to your field? Um, you know, there's language, but there's also kind of the um, the cultural aspect of it all, um, you know, we've seen what happened uh, in our political climate uh, the past decade. It's been very tumultuous for Latina people um, and immigrants as well, um, like you mentioned. So how does that kind of play out in your professional life? Do you see it as an asset? Are there any hindrances? Um, yeah, anything that you guys would like to speak on in that kind of scope? Well, I um, guess I'll jump in. <laughs> and I would say, you know, while I was at Kenyan my first year, I may not have seen my identity as a, you know, proud indigenous Latina woman as an asset. It was a little bit rough initially. When I started to um, work as an attorney, I absolutely embraced it and saw it as one of the biggest, if not my biggest asset, the fact that um, I was multilingual, obviously, that I uh, had experiences that many of my colleagues had not, um, but, you know, in many respects could identify with some of our clients, um, get them to open up more uh, to me, because in me, they saw their mother or their sister, etc., those were incredibly important tools um, that you really cannot teach anyone. So I think in terms of your question, I love the question. I think that who I am as a proud indigenous Latina woman is, if not my biggest, one of my biggest assets that, you know, that includes everything, the language, um, our culture, and um, what we bring to the table. And uh, where I work, I'm very very fortunate. I work specifically in the immigrant justice project uh, of the Southern Poverty Law Center. So I am surrounded by folks who have similar experiences. We've been very careful to nurture young Latina lawyers, uh, folks who are interested in the type of work. So 
it's really interesting to see that from the start of, you know, when I first started, because I did go, uh, unlike Gerard, I went straight from uh, college to law school to my first job. I, you know, have seen a huge, in my own personal experience, a huge growth in terms of who my colleagues are and the ability to mentor, run across young um, Latin A lawyers who are interested in the type of work that we do and the ability to mentor them is another great gift. So yeah, uh, it's a big part. I, I think that the, the ability is the, really the privilege to mentor folks is something that um, I would echo that um, all of us who you know have, have reached a certain level in our career, um, we didn't get here except by the by the you know the, the help of others and to make sure that you are the other individuals that you get to work with that you share knowledge that that you may have learned a, a, along the way is is invaluable to be an ally for those uh, in, individuals and I think anytime if you've ever been somewhere where you know one I'm first generation immigrant and my parents came and um, the cultural premium was on assimilation, not on asserting identity. So um, my dad would introduce himself not as Solis, but Solis. Um, and when my mom would speak uh, Spanish, you know, at the Kmart or whatever, I'd get really tense about it. <laughs> um, and so I think it's, um, you know, having some experience that, you know, that, that's not something to run away from. And so when you see someone maybe who's, who's new in a situation, um, reaching out to them and saying, look, you don't run away from who you are and, and what you're good at. And these are things that, that I've learned that have helped me, maybe they can help you too, uh, because then they'll pass that on to the person who, who's next in line and, and that'll have a lasting impact. Yeah, uh, there, there's a lot of code switching. Um, and Javier, I see that you um, would like to speak, but um, I think in your fields, I'm curious if uh, you feel that that mentorship and that um, representation has um, become increasingly um, more, more helpful for younger people that are going into law, younger Latinas, people of color. <clears throat> because, I mean, I feel like I mean, you all could speak on it, but um, the field of law seems very, there's a stereotype that it's very, very white, very male dominated. Um, and I'm curious, you know, how, how do you feel um, that the demographics are changing? And do you feel that it's going into a positive direction in terms of including different experiences of diversity, cultures, and things of that nature? Um, I mean, that's a, a big question. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, Latinx people are significantly underrepresented within the law. Um, and there's a, a number of different reasons for that, I think. Um, I think statistically, the numbers have moved minimally um, over the last 10 years or so, certainly not to the degree that would be expected. However, you know, what we do see, of course, particularly in the last three or four years, but but generally, uh, you know, over the last ten years, particularly, is is you know an increasing emphasis that's being placed on on diversity and inclusion and ensuring that equal opportunity is provided uh, on a on a more broad spectrum, uh, particularly to those that are, are are part of you know affinity groups. And so, I think that what the the impact of that is is that as that focus continues, you're seeing more Latinx lawyers that are rising to more senior levels within, within law firms, within government, within corporations. And, and with that power uh, comes a, a, a more significant degree of influence that can be made upon hiring decisions, upon cultural decisions, upon uh, you know, social cor corporate responsibility. Um, and so uh, I, I think that as that continues to grow, you're going to start to see a more of a snowball effect. And, uh, you know, I, I think one of the one of the most important things is, is you know, for Lat you know, individuals who are interested in, in a career in the law and then young Latino lawyers as well, 
uh, to have someone that looks like them, to have someone with their background who they can see uh, achieving at a high level, who they can kind of model their career off of, because it lets them know that, that it's possible, that it, it, it can be done. Um, and then, you know, I think that, that there's so much power in community and there is a, a pretty substantial Latino community out there and it's accessible through, through many different avenues. And, and through that community, you know, you can build relationships that will help propel you in your career. I would, I would just offer, um, you know, the, the, the converse, there's no question that law is very white, very male. Um, and, and in particular for female attorneys of any background, the, the, the ABA did a study not long ago, maybe three or four years ago, that even a senior partner at a prestigious law firm is more likely to be mistaken for an administrative assistant than, than you know, the, the managing senior partner. So that, that definitely exists in the law um, moving forward. And I suppose the tragedy is that it took the events of the summer of 2020 to, I think, explain to many of us um, the dangers of implicit bias. I mean, look at the murder of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor. Um, those events have made it more real to explain to folks, this, things don't work the same for everybody in, in, in our system. And, um, you know, those are tragic examples, but in my current workplace, it's, it's a way to have a conversation about implicit bias. You know, that we all have these on some level. The question is, what are you gonna do about it? And so when you can have those conversations in your hiring meetings, or as attorneys, you're going to be very close to folks making significant decisions to make sure that they are thinking about those things and actually interrogating yourself too, about what your own biases are. If you saw the confirmation of Merrick Garland, um, who's now, of course, Attorney General of the United States, he talked about this very eloquently. Um, and I recommend it to you to, to go and see his answer about when he talked about implicit bias. It doesn't make you uh, acknowledging that you have these biases or you operate or you default to stereotypes. It doesn't make you a racist unless you don't do anything about it. <laughs> you know, so there's, there's a call to action there. But um, being able to refer to those events um, has been very um, compelling in, here at the University of South Florida, when we've, we've had opportunities to make hiring decisions and, and being very careful and deliberate about um, what's influencing those decisions. Just to quickly echo both um, Gerard and Javier, um, one of the reasons why I accepted this particular job um, as a senior supervising attorney was because I would have hiring authority. When I was in the government, I was uh, part of our hiring committees. And I completely agree. I think it's actually our responsibility as folks who have um, the experience and who are at a point where they can, uh, where we can exert some sort of influence and help you know, the next generations come up um, so that it becomes, um, you know, uh, what do you call that, that expression in English, you know, um, to pay it forward and just to give a hand and uplift people. Um, I think there, you know, if you are thinking as a student of um, going into law, one of the, I think, more important things that you can do, in addition to being an amazing lawyer at whatever you do, we need people both in the private and the public sector. We need, you know, Javier and uh, Gerards, and we need, you know, people who do public interest work, but all of us on this call are important to how we're going to uplift our community, all of us. Um, but we do need also folks who have hiring influence and the ability to mentor. So that is something that I would urge folks, young people who are thinking about becoming lawyers is you know, try to put yourself in a position where you can exert hiring influence, where you can be a mentor. And don't forget, you know, to you know, reach out and bring folks with you to uplift. So um, I really uh, appreciate both of your answers, um, Javier and Gerard. Yeah, I, I appreciate all of your responses. And, and I'm kind of curious, um, you know, particularly with the field of law and, and the nature of the work that you all do, it's, it's very heavy. Um, 
to you know have to deal with the cases, but also your personal life and how that plays because you can't really separate the two. So, what are some ways in which you um, you take care of yourselves, and how do you really manage your professional life with you know your cultural identity and everything else that's happening in the world? Well, I'm married to a lawyer, so I've long since given up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think lawyers have one of the highest, if not one of the highest suicide rates, one of the highest uh, drug and alcohol abuse rates. And I think that's because, you know, it, it's both the nature of the profession and also kind of in some instances that the type of people that are drawn into the profession. Um, it's, I think that as a litigator, you know, it is exhausting to spend your day in constant uh, dispute with with someone else, and you know it's really it's really difficult to put that down and, and to walk away from it. And it it took me years and years and years to not be it to not take it personally, um, to be able to 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 understand that you know everyone's just doing a job and they're trying to to do the best they can for their client, but it, it's really not about me. Um, and and to to become a you know, to be able to perform well and give it the, the attention uh, that it deserves without having an emotional attachment to, you know, to the outcome necessarily. Um, it, it, it's really difficult. It's, it's something that, you know, I certainly still struggle with today. And you just, you just have to, it, it just takes practice. It also takes having the discipline to, you know, sometimes put your phone down, shut off email and understand that you're, just not going to respond till till Sunday night or till Monday morning, whatever you you know you have to you have to know yourself and be able to take time away from it because even even if you're not responding to an email, just by by opening that email and reading the contents, you're being pulled back into your professional life and and then it, it takes time to once again disconnect from that and, and it's just it's mentally and emotionally exhausting. And so, I mean, everyone has to develop their own habits, but there has to be a discipline and being able to put your, put it down and separate yourself from it. Sorry, I'm joined late. Can I participate in the conversation? I'm also a Latina alumni lawyer. Yeah, um, absolutely. Thanks. So my name's Winston Sale. I graduated class of 2002. Javier Javier and I were actually uh, pretty good friends in college and uh, couldn't, couldn't miss the opportunity to join him on the panel. So uh, I, I'm an assistant general counsel with the Federal Housing Finance Agency, which is the federal government agency that regulates Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, which are the two mortgage financing giants. And one thing I want to say about this in particular is that there are career paths in law that are a better balance, provide a better work-life balance. And government tends to be one of those options. I've practiced in uh, private practice for several years in, uh, in a commercial real estate practice and worked extremely long hours, found it very difficult to balance my professional life with my home life. But having moved to the federal government, it's just a much better balance for me personally and also for my family. So, I mean, that option is out there. You definitely will work hard as a lawyer, I think, regardless of what path you go down, and especially getting there through law school and, and finding your career. But it isn't the sort of hopeless grind of 80 hour weeks forever for everybody. I mean, you can choose other paths. So if there's, that's a glimmer of light to those of you considering a career. Hi, Thank Winston, you. good um, to meet you. If I just could quickly um, say he's absolutely right. Um, in fact, uh, it's not just uh, other paths within the law, but. Once you have a JD, many other doors open up for you um, that aren't necessarily related to practicing or, you know, to the TV um, lawyer uh, life. Um, you could do many different things uh, with a JD. You don't even have to, you know, um, you don't even have to pass the bar uh, in many instances for um, you to use to be able to use that uh, JD effectively and further your career goals. One last thing, prioritization. Um, you know, I am for first and foremost a mother. I have two um, teenagers, 
And I think just as you prioritize in college um, and you will in law school, you'll prioritize in life. Um, there are certain times where you have a, I guess I would call a life seasonal change. Your priorities will change. Um, my priority now is being a mother to two young Latina kids who are navigating, you know, parts of the world that I've been through, right? And um, just trying to raise them up to be good humans. And uh, I'm glad that my employer understands that. Uh, just find someone who understands it and it's the right fit for you. Sasha, you have uh, your hand raised. Yeah. Um, Chris, let me your thing. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Sasha Fanny Holston. For those of you who don't know me, um, I'm class of 2011, and I work in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, but I'm also a JD uh, who needs to pass the bar again. But I did want to echo some of what you were all saying um, about just the realities of like the work-life balance of being an attorney. Um, I worked in a firm in Boston for two years before I came back to Ohio um, and I was doing asbestos litigation, which is um, not fun. Um, and there really wasn't that work-life balance. And so I really um, coming here and you know, doing a career change into, into the DEI space has been really valuable um, for me just because I can, I'm thinking differently um, and I'm using like my legal education is still, you know, really um, central to like a lot of the things I, 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 I want to do um, and can want to, can want to do in this, in this position. So I just wanted to echo um, some of that, um, those things. And I, and I really, um, I keep I keep nodding and and, and agreeing with every with all, with all what you're saying. So just wanted to to put that out there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sasha. And yeah, Gerard, uh, do you want to speak on this as well? I, my points have been made. I, I yeah. agree with the, the um, other panelists of have, have shared. Yeah, I mean, it, it is hard to kind of remember that you know the self care portion is important. Um, I mean. There are many different kind of career paths that you can take in law, um, as you've all pointed out. Um, but I think, you know, it, it's important, especially as Latina people um, in this country, there is a lot of discrimination, a lot of obstacles, but also a lot of things to be proud of and celebrate. Um, so it's not always, you know, good or bad. Um, we are at about 15 minutes. So um, before we kind of move into questions, I wanted to ask if you had any advice for Latina students who are interested in law or who are kind of unsure, but maybe are looking into that as a possible field. I would say, don't, go, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Say, don't be afraid of networking um, and reaching out to folks on this panel, folks you may know. I, I hate networking. But every time I go to an event, I, I, I learn something, meet someone, maybe I have a chance to share something that might be useful to somebody. But don't, don't exclude yourself. That's, that's how the world is. And go to those events, meet people. You'll feel better for it. And you'll leave and you go, actually, that wasn't that bad. <laughs> That'd be my advice. And if I could um, go back one subject. Uh, one question talking about you know the the perception of the appearance of the field of law right so I I don't look Puerto Rican my mother's Puerto Rican my family in Puerto Rico I don't have a Latin sounding name so I am able to sort of be a stealth <laughs> Latino in in my space but one issue that we have especially in the federal government is trouble hiring qualified people into jobs that are essential to the operation of the government and, and the way that you know it interacts with society in particular particularly in the area of finance and, and my area of real estate finance it is very heavily white and male but instead of looking that looking at that as a barrier to entry you know i would recommend that students look at that as a challenge and an invitation to really add value and and to bring a perspective that that is lacking in that space and that you know, 
people like me are, are readily aware that it's lacking and that we need, you know, more input from a broader group of people, more diverse group of people to avoid the kind of group think that has led to problems of institutional racism, and, you know, undesirable uh, public policy outcomes over, you know, the course of history, really. So, uh, you know, look at that as a challenge and an invitation and not as a barrier. Thank you, um, Winston, and then um, Lewis and Javier, do you, do you guys have any um, kind of advice? Yeah, you know, I mean, this is this is so maybe obvious, but uh, go and go and try it before you go to law school. Um, so few people do that, and I didn't do it. Uh, I I wish I had um, because I, I think one, it gives you a, a broader. If, if you go and work at a legal department or a law firm, it'll give you a broader understanding of the various aspects of the legal profession, but. It, it, it'll show you more, you know, what's attractive to you and what is not attractive to you before you have to make those decisions. And it's going to make you more successful in law school because you're going to have an integration to the law and the type of thinking that's needed to, to be successful during your, you know, your, your graduate ed education. Um, so I, you also make some money. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a, a win all around. Yeah, like Javier, I... I went straight from college to law school. Um, I tell people now uh, that I wish I had taken some time to work in the legal field to see if it was right for me. Um, I probably would have stayed, uh, but I think it's it's a good piece of advice to look um, and personally, you know, experience what it could be like and see how others who are lawyers, how happy they are with their jobs, what they're doing. Um, the last you know, thing I just want to emphasize with respect to this is, you know, I would be glad to talk to folks, to talk to current students, to talk to folks who are um, you know, considering whether or not to go to law school. Um, use me and I'm sure others on this panel who volunteered as a resource, please. Um, that is, uh, as Gerard correctly said, you know, part of our, I think, um, responsibility and truly it's an honor to, to serve as a resource for folks who are in a position that we were, in my case, many, many, many years ago. Um, so I'd be delighted uh, to talk to folks who have questions or just want to say hi. Well, thank you. Um... And yeah, and with that, I will open it up the last 10 minutes for questions that um, anybody in the audience would like to ask. Um, yeah, I mean, Professor Sheffield, you're here and um, you have three of your former students. So I don't know if you um, would like to jump in and, and kind of ask any questions about them now. Actually, they're much too intimidating for me to, to try <laughs> to pose a question. You know, they've been well educated at Kenyon College and and uh, obviously have shown themselves to be extraordinary professional people now. And I have to tell you, it's terribly humbling to come to appreciate that you can have whatever small piece of an impact upon the lives and trajectories of, of people as they move about their, their lives. So that, that's really cool for me. Uh, I don't have a question other than simply saying, um, uh, shucks, gee whiz, uh, how in the world did you do so much in such a short period of time? I mean, Luz is talking about so, so long ago. Um, I was in law school in the 70s, so that seems like it was, you know, like forever uh, ago. But um, congratulations to all of you. Right? Uh, Kenyon should take great pride in having you on this panel and having you as graduates of the institution. I would like to echo that, I think. You're all very, very admirable alumni. And I think I appreciate having, you know, the opportunity to be in conversation with each of you. Um, you know, I don't know where my career is gonna go, uh, what direction it's gonna take me after Kenyon, but it's great to see that, you know, there are alumni that I can talk to um, who are doing great work and, you know, can be points of contact. So thank you. Um, I was just going to say a few things. 
Um, I had my hand, I'll lower my hand. Um, but I did want to also say to the students who are on the panel today, I mean, I've been saying this since I got here last year, if you have questions about law school, talk to me. Um, I graduated in 2019, so it wasn't that far away, far ago. So I have, um, I'm always happy to have those conversations with everyone. Um, and I think it's just, I think there's a lot of safety in numbers and a lot of solidarity in numbers. Um, I mean, I can only speak to my experience because uh, I went to law school in Boston. Um, and so Javier may be aware of like, you know, HMBA and some of these other really great organizations, the affinity groups um, in Boston and in the law and also in the Northeast, um, for example, have really great opportunities um, for students. Um, even as a student, as a law student, you can go to a lot of those conferences and a lot of those um, events that are being planned. They want to see law students there. They want, they really, really just want to help and mentor. So um, it's always something really important um, for, for you all to know. And so, like I said, and if the panelists, um, I'm happy to give you all my email address. I can put it in the chat, um, but I'd love to stay in contact um, with you all um, for continued programming and things that we're doing in this office that I think um, would be really beneficial um, for your for your wisdom and 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 experiences. So I just wanted to put that out there as well. Yeah, no, I I you referenced the HMBA. I I've been um, I'm the VP of programs for the HMBA, and I've been on the board for for six or seven years, and it, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal organization. And there's there's just a tremendous amount of resources uh, that are available to uh, Latino law students. And so, you know, if you're considering uh, a career in the law or going into law school, I, I highly recommend membership in the HMBA is free for all uh, for all law students. So I highly recommend joining and, and getting involved locally or trying to attend one of the one of the national conferences and, and there's uh, a million opportunities there to start to build a network and and generate relationships that can really help uh, move you along in your career yeah um are there any other questions from the audience or any any kind of um thoughts Yeah, Johan. Hi. Um, well, first of all, just thank you all for being here. I really appreciate the opportunity to hear about your experience in the law field. Um, I just, since, you know, uh, as a college student, like the next step would be law school. Um, so I'm just wondering um, if you have any recommendations on how to go about uh, just the law school application process and then choosing the right law school to go to. Thank you. I can give you the advice that Professor Sheffield gave me, which is um, uh, think about where you want to live. Um, where you go to law school will have an impact on, on that. There are some schools, of course, that have a national reach, but generally, if you go to a law school, and they have a region that they can can place into. I think Winston's point was good about, you know, also looking at, at uh, positions in government. Those will take you to near state capitals, federal government, BDC. But um, that advice served me very well in making choices about law school um, and helping me get the pool down. And then you just have to start thinking about um, uh, I, things like the LSAT, which are terrible. But, uh, <laughs> um, but, um, also think about what you're going to put in that personal statement, you know, so once you get in is one thing, but, but picking the school that's right for you, don't just go with a reputation. That was other good advice I got and um, go with where you think you want to live and where you think you might have some alignment. Uh, but uh, that was good advice, Professor Sheffield, it helped me out. I ended up in a place that worked out for me. So I would recommend thinking very carefully, carefully about how you're going to pay for law school. I borrowed the full nut for law school, which graduating in 08 was $155,000, not including living expenses. And my interest rate on that loan was something like 6% at 
at the time. So that worked out to like $1,400 a month that I had to pay on top of rent and living expenses in DC. I also had the unfortunate luck of graduating into the 2008 financial crisis, wanting to be a real estate lawyer. So I had a very difficult time finding a job and was, you know, five years out of law school, or I sorry, uh, six years out of Kenyan and looking seriously at moving back in with my parents coming out of Georgetown Law, which was for me quite depressing at the time. Um, if I could do it again, I think that I would have applied to more law schools and seen where I could have gotten money to go to school. Because one thing I didn't understand when I chose Georgetown in 05 was the decisions that the financial situation I would be in coming out of law school would make for me. So it really put a limitation on uh, what kind of jobs I could take. So like I basically had to take law firm jobs even if I didn't want anything to do with the practice area because I had to pay off that debt. Uh, I had to put off getting married and starting a family because of the amount of debt that I had. It also made it very difficult for me to buy a home for several years. So I ultimately paid off that debt and my life is much better for it, but uh, I could have taken a lot of stress out of my late twenties and early thirties had I not had that you know sort of dark cloud of debt hanging over my head the whole time. And this is doubly important for people coming out of college with student loan debt, which I, I imagine a fair amount are. So if you are unsure about that and unsure of how to pay for college or your loans or any of those questions, it is imperative that you talk to somebody that understands finance before you commit to three years of law school and, and the costs associated with that. So either financial planner, or your parents, if they're educated and you know, nobody else, I, I'm more than happy to talk to anybody that has questions because, you know, I, I lived this and I'm now a finance expert in part because I had to teach myself uh, along the way, so. Thank you. Um, that's pretty good advice, I would say. And I, I guess a follow-up question to kind of deciding on the financial factor would be, just like I know um, early decision is kind of a huge deal and it's a big commitment, but is there any circumstance where it would be recommended or if it's just better to just completely stay away from that? So I, I applied early decision to Georgetown because my application was a relative long shot based on my grades coming out of Kenyan. And what I learned after the fact is that if you apply early decision, um, I don't know if this is a rule everywhere, but it, at least at Georgetown, it greatly reduced the likelihood that you were gonna receive any kind of financial aid because they knew they had you essentially in the bag. So uh, I don't know if anybody else can speak to that, but th that was something that I ran into after the fact when my friends were getting offers for financial aid at other schools and I was basically locked into Georgetown at that point. And I, I didn't even think about it because I was like, I'm going to Georgetown, I'm gonna be rich. <laughs> and then, the reality was quite the opposite of that, unfortunately. Yeah, that, that makes perfect I sense. I never really thought about it that way. Don't chase reputation. Yeah. You go to the, the school, see if you feel a fit, um, a connection, spend some time with students there. Um, reputation can go a long way, certainly, particularly if you want to go work in a big firm. That's going to be essential. But okay. after that, not as important. Yeah, and I mean, I, I can, and again, don't even get me started about law school loans and what my student loan situation looks like. Um, the 20,000 that I'm getting is not from, from when that gets canceled. It's gonna make a very small dent, but it's okay. You know, it's a dent, I'll take it. Um, but that is something to think about. Also just like, yeah, unless you really want to be like, um, you want to do the tr like really traditional law path, like, you know, do summer associate program or do, um, or go work in a fancy firm where you're going to be working hours and hours and hours and you're not going to have a life, um, then you might want to start looking at, like that would be really important to go to a t like one of the, like Harvard, Yale, um, Stanford, U Chicago, Georgetown. 
Um, some of those schools are more, you're more likely to end up there. So I went to a very small school. I went to New England Law um, in Boston. Uh, Javier might know uh, of that school. It's fairly close to where he's at. Um, and it was very much like Kenyon, um, very small. A lot of professors who actually cared about you and, and wanted to see you succeed. Um, and that is that is a rarity in law school. Most times you hear the stereotypical things about it being like very cutthroat, very competitive, very just very self-centered almost. And while there's a lot of competition and I think that's healthy, um, what I liked about my law school is that it, it didn't have to deal with the cutthroat aspect. And I was an evening student, which I don't would recommend, but that is a different story. Um, so I had another year um, added to my um, education. So um, you just really have to find your support network and, 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 and utilize those people. And, you know, that'll help you so much um, when you're there, because it's not easy. You know, it's not meant to be easy. Um, so I, I knew I wanted to go into to private practice, and I got a great piece of advice from the, the father of one of Winston and I's mutual friends, uh, who was the, I think he was the president of the DC Bar Association at the time. And what he told me was, grades matter more than, than school. If, if you're going to go and you're going to excel, then you'll, you'll have whatever opportunities you want. And so I ended up going to UConn and on a almost a full scholarship and I paid like five thousand dollars a year plus the cost to live in Hartford which is which is fairly low um so I ended up in a, the opposite situation of Winston where I had I had very little by way of loans coming out of, of law school and I did well enough that I I had uh you know ample opportunity to to enter um you know the the, the area of the field of the law that I wanted to all right. Uh, it is about five minutes after one. Um, so thank you all for your time. Um, I believe um, Luis and Javier um, added their email in the chat. Um, but yeah, thank you all for your time. Thank you for being on the panel and sharing your wisdom. Thank you for moderating. And thank you, Kim, for arranging. Thank you. Good to see you. you. Take care, Professor. Good Shepard. to see you, Javier. You too, Winston. You look great. <laughs>